<clears throat> Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the February 28th meeting of the Arlington Redevelopment Board. Uh, this open meeting of the Redevelopment Board is being conducted remotely, consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. For this meeting, the ARB is convening via Zoom as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating via video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other people may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. So um, at this time, I'll go ahead and take a roll call to confirm that all of the members of the board are present and can hear me, starting with Kim Lau. Present. Jean Benson. Present. Melissa Titakoulos. Present. Steve Revelak. Good evening, Madam Chair. And I am Rachel Zemberry. Uh, we also have two members of the Department of Planning and Community Development with us, Jennifer Reit. Present. And Kelly Lima. Present. Fabulous. So with that, we will uh, move right into our first agenda item, which is an overview of the um, current uh, development guidelines uh, for the MBTA communities. And I will turn it over to uh, Jenny and Kelly. Thank you, Rachel, and thank you to the board for giving us this time on the agenda tonight to talk about MBTA communities. Kelly is actually gonna make the presentation, but I just wanted to give a quick introduction to it, um, which is to say that we, um, we had started talking about this almost immediately when we learned about it last year and um, you know, thought that we would have sort of an urgent need for compliance because we didn't understand uh, when the economic development bond bill was first passed, we, we didn't actually understand when things would need to be compliant and what things meant. Um, all that we knew was that state law 40A, which is the Zoning Act, was changed and that there would be a requirement for an MBTA community to become compliant at some point in time. Um, so we had proposed a warrant article and then of course the board pretty quickly after that uh, decided to, you know, it was already filed at that point, but it was voted no action on because we moved it to be voted no action on and nothing further uh, occurred. But um, over the course of the last year, the Department of Housing and Community Development at the state level has been working on development of draft guidelines um, and having a number of sessions with communities, uh, making presentations um, kind of across the state at this point trying to educate people about the guidelines to both the Massachusetts Municipal Association, uh, the Mass Municipal Lawyers Association, various sort of statewide organizations are trying to best understand what exactly the guidelines mean and what it means to potentially have to comply. So what that means is we're doing the same thing. We're sharing the draft guidelines and we just want to have a conversation with the board about it. Um, we have given a little bit of thought to it based upon what we understand the guidelines to mean, but there could be other interpretations. There could be a lot more information forthcoming. And of course, because they're guidelines in a draft format, awaiting public comment to be received by March 31st, and then with the expectation that they'll be finalized in summer, a lot could change. So um, let's not completely hang our hat on everything discussed tonight, but more make this a conversation to talk about what could we do in relationship to MBTA communities potentially. And I say that because there is likely the possibility that we will need to comply with something in order to apply for really important grant funds from the state that relate to our public infrastructure. And that's actually a very broad statement about infrastructure, but we have a particular project in mind. So it is important, it will become important to Arlington, but it is not imminent right now. But we wanted to be able to share with the board what we understand at this point in time and start the discussion. Um, and as Kelly will share in the presentation, we would intend to come back to the board once we have a lot more information. So. Um, with that, I will hand it over to Kelly, who has started to, hopefully you can see her screen and then we'll come back for, or Kelly, you can choose if you want us to pause in the middle 
for questions. Oh, you're, um, I see your mouth moving, but no words. It would help if I was unmuted. Um, yeah, I think maybe we can get through this and then we can have a discussion um, if that's fine with everyone here. Is everyone seeing the main screen here, MBTA communities? Yes. Okay. Um, so thank you, Jenny. Um, as Jenny mentioned, the purpose of this presentation is really to provide you with an overview of the legislation and then talk about DHCD's draft guidelines. And those are two separate things right now. Uh, we also wanted to invite you to submit comments to DHCD. That deadline is fat rapidly approaching at um, March 31. I wanted to explain a bit of the timeline. So what's happening next, both at a state level and then the timeline for compliance um, and share some initial outlines of consideration for districts or districts. Um, so again, what I have here in the presentation is just talking about the legislation, talking about the funding and compliance, um, sharing the draft guidelines with you, um, having a discussion around that, talking about the timeline and then some possible ideas for compliance. Um, in the legislation, in order to be eligible for certain kinds of funding, um, MBTA communities legislation states that we have to have at least one zoning district of reasonable size in which multifamily housing is permitted as of right. Um, this is in, as Jenny mentioned, this is in Mass General Law Chapter 48, codified in Section 30, and sorry, Section 3A, as part of the multifamily zoning requirement. One district of reasonable size, multifamily per housing permitted as of right, no age restriction, so it has to be suitable for families with children. It can't be limited to seniors only. Um, and in that district, you have to have a minimum gross density of 15 units per acre. And that district can't be more than a half a mile away from a subway station or a bus station. Um, there are some other locations in the MBTA communities legislation, um, but this is as it's applicable to Arlington. So this specific language um, in the legislation provides a broad framework, but it doesn't have the kind of detail to direct implementation. So DHCD drafted um, draft guidelines and has shared those in December of this year, of last year, sorry. And those draft guidelines um, interpret the legislation in this way. So DHCD is interpreting that reasonable size of being at least 50 acres in total. So that can be over one district or several districts, but in total, they have to, they have to encompass at least 50 acres. Um, they define multifamily housing as a building with three or more residential dwelling units. And again, that's as of right. Um, you can't require it uh, to go through a special permit process. Um, no age restrictions or bedroom limits. You can't limit it to one bedroom only. Um, it has to be suitable for families. And then because Arlington is categorized as a rapid transit community, because of our proximity to Alewife Station, um, the capacity number um, is based on our total 2020 census housing units. And Based, based on our categorization as a rapid transit community, we have 25% of our total housing units, we have to have the capacity for 25% of our total housing units in that district or in those districts. So because of our total numbers, that means we have to have the capacity for 5,115 units. Um, what's important to note about this is by capacity, they don't mean in addition to, it's basically as if you had a tabula rasa, if you had like no development at all on a site, what would you have the capacity to develop, to develop there as of right? So we may have in certain districts, we may have the capacity for 4,000 units, but we haven't met that 5,115 unit capacity. And then the, the guidelines are a little bit more flexible than the, the legislation might make them sound. Um, at least half of the land area within the district is within half a mile of the station. So the district can extend beyond that half mile radius, but at least half of it has to be within that half mile radius. By complying with the legislation, we remain eligible for funding from MassWorks Infrastructure Program, from the Housing Choice Initiative, and for some communities from the Local Capital Projects Fund, although Arlington does not qualify for this latter funding source. Um, so how could we use the funding? Um, we, as Jenny mentioned, um, 
Part of the reason why we wanted to talk about this tonight is because we are currently in the process of applying for MassWorks funding. Um, MassWorks funding is, it provides funding for design and construction, for funding for public infrastructure like roads, utilities, um, bike lanes, pedestrian facilities, and improvements to public properties. I'll get into that in a little bit um, on the next slide. We are not currently a housing choice community. Um, we have not qualified for that, but there is a potential for us to maybe become a housing choice community in the next year or two. If you are a housing choice community, you become qualified for, you become eligible for community capital grants funding. Um, it also is an excellent source of funding for certain kinds of planning, like um, funding for a master plan or updating a master plan, uh, funding for studying zoning amendments um, or other sorts of studies related to economic development or zoning, what have you. And again, that local capital projects fund we are not eligible for. In the past five years, we have not pursued MassWorks funding. And as I mentioned, we're not a housing choice community, so we have not pursued or been awarded funding. But as Jenny mentioned, we are applying for MassWorks funding, particularly for the Mass Ave and Appleton project. Um, this is a very large funding source. MassWorks um, in 2021, their awards averaged $1.1 million per community or per project that received funding. So this is a, this is a very large source of funding. Um, Housing Choice Initiative grants are a little, uh, definitely smaller. They have about a $5 million pool of funding um, and we may become eligible for that in the next one to two years, um, but we are not currently eligible. Now, looking ahead into the future, um, we may start to see the state funnel more funding through these programs tied to incentive-based standards. So the state may try to incentivize communities to become compliant with MBT communities legislation in order, and in order to receive this funding. So I think compliance is something that is important to consider and it's important, part of the reason why we're here tonight is to really talk about how we can maintain our compliance. Um, the draft guidelines, DHCD um, approached the guidelines using two factors. So it's that reasonable size that they determined to be 50 acres. And it's also that, that capacity level. So based on your level of transit service um, with the expectations that, that communities have, that have access to subway service should be able to provide greater capacity for housing than those with bus service or commuter rail service. Arlington, um, does Arlington comply now with the guidelines? Uh, the short answer is no. Um, we do not in our zoning. We don't limit. Um, uh, we don't limit our zoning based on age or size of units, number of bedrooms, size of bedrooms, etc. Um, but what we also do not do is we don't allow for multifamily zoning. We don't allow for multifamily development by right. Um, even in our R3 zoning district, uh, you are required to get a special permit in order to develop a three family unit. So um, basically you cannot develop multifamily housing by right, which is part of the, one of the key requirements of the MBTA communities legislation. We also don't have a district of 50 acres that's within a half mile of MBTA station um, that provides that 15 residential units per acre with the capacity that meets the current, the current draft guidelines standards. So again, at that capacity um, uh, of 5,115 units, we, we don't have that right now. The timeline for compliance. Um, in order to comply with the guidelines, we don't have to have zoning right now. We have to be moving toward it. So we, um, by May 2 of this year, we need to hold a briefing with the select board and submit information regarding current compliance back to DHCD. Um, then we need to start working on a plan. Um, that plan actually will, will likely depend on what the final guidance from DHCD is. So DHCD has issued their draft guidance right now. They're receiving comments until March 31 of this year of 2022. They will turn around and issue the final updated guidance later this summer. And then we will have until March 31 of 2023 to just submit an action plan to DHCD. And this should describe how we intend to come into, comp come into compliance to the state for approval. And then by December 31 of 2023, um, any action plan that we've developed must be adopted. So this would be adopted by town meeting. 
As far as next steps, as I mentioned, that deadline of March 31 for comments on the draft guidelines, we would really appreciate it if you are going to submit comments. Um, you can submit them here through mass.gov slash MBTA communities. We'd appreciate it if you copied staff on this. Um, it is going to be helpful to us as we will be um, helping to guide that planning process and determining what the zoning will be. Um, it'd be helpful to know what your feedback is on the draft guidelines right now. This would help us um, definitely shape um, based on community feedback and board feedback. Um, also consider attending the select board meeting. We're looking to schedule that meeting, that briefing meeting with the select board in March. Um, we don't have a date yet, um, but we will let you know when that happens. Um, so consider attending that um, just to hear their questions and comments. And then once the DHCD final guidelines are issued, we will return to you with an update and a discussion, a proposed schedule for how we're going to, how we would like to move forward move forward. And this will likely happen by the end of the summer or early fall of, of this year. Um, so with the draft guidelines in mind, um, we did want to provide the board with a sense of the types of districts, size, location, et cetera, that be, could be considered for future compliance. Um, I do want to caveat all of this with the idea that these are not plans. These are just initial sketches on maps, um, just so you can get a sense for like, what does 50 acres even look like in Arlington? Um, what is an overall size of a district? What kind of areas could we be considering for this? Uh, we have not done planning around this. We've just done some studies to kind of get a sense for, for what do these guidelines even mean? Um, some of the ideas for compliance with the draft guidelines. The first would be to the first category of, of ideas would be to just reduce the development that's subject to a special permit. So are there areas in town where we could allow for three or more residential units by right instead of requiring that they go through a special permit process? Um, could those locations be either along or immediately behind Mass Ave? If you look back to some of our old zoning maps, um, Mass Ave was sort of a business corridor that extended about 150 feet on either side of the street center line. And so maybe thinking about some of that corridor idea may be helpful in, in thinking about where we could allow for a little bit more density. Um, could we consider a little bit more uh, multifamily housing by right in our R3 through R7 zoning districts, or perhaps in, perhaps in some of our business districts, maybe in the B1, B2, or B4, so long as they provide for um, mi mixed use development. Um, the other category that we could pursue is thinking about increasing the dwelling unit flexibility. So we could create a very large 40 r district of maybe 150 to 300 acres. Um, this is a recommendation of the net zero action plan. It's also a recommendation in the draft housing plan. Um, and this would be something that a lot, a lot of other communities are starting to think about in considering the, D, the DHCD guidelines as considering a 40 yard district. We could also consider permitting two accessory dwelling units in single family zones. And that would get us to a three family, um, essentially getting us to three dwelling units per lot um, by right. So looking at the maps, um, we looked at three different areas. I think when everybody thought about, and everybody thinks about MBTA communities within Arlington, they immediately think Alewife because we are a mass transit community and we are sort of tied to our, lo our location is tied to that subway station in Alewife. Um, but we have spoken with DHCD and they have let us know that we could also consider Arlington Heights around the bus depot as a potential location for that half mile radius. And then while Arlington Center does not technically qualify, we did consider this as a third area um, in order to increase the overall district size and sort of as an alternative for thinking about um, unit density because we do need to have the reach those capacity numbers. Um, so we located the center of that radius, that third radius in Arlington Center at the intersection of where the Route 80 and Route 77 bus lines converge. Um, so again, as I mentioned, these are totally for discussion. These are for illustrative purposes. Um, you know, one option would be considering um, locating the district completely in East Arlington. Um, this, you know, if we wanted to think about a district sort of around the Alewife station, but then extending up into Capitol Square, what you see here is approximately 65 to 70 acres. Um, more than half of it is within a half mile radius of Alewife. So it would meet that compliance of the 
the reasonable size requirement. Um, but the one thing to consider is that it would have to also have that capacity for 5,115 units. Another option would be to completely locate that district within Arlington Heights. Um, what you see here is approximately 50 to 55 acres. Um, all of, almost all of this is within a half mile of the bus depot. Um, but again, as I mentioned, you know, we have to think about those two requirements from DHCD. So we also wanted to present two starting points for thinking about what would a larger district look like if we wanted to spread that capacity over a larger acreage. And so another option would be to think about having allowing or having more than one district, having three districts, um, thinking about using each of our business districts as sort of center points for thinking about how we could meet those capacity and um, density requirements. These um, districts kind of roughly outlined here are about 140 to 145 acres and we have one located in each business district. Um, each of them is within a half mile radius of that transit. And then one final option would be to consider and actually, not one final option. There are actually multiple options. These are just some initial stabs at drawings on a drawings on a map. I think there are a lot of ways you could interpret this. Um, but we could consider looking at just an overall corridor overlay. So setting a distance from the Mass Ave center line. Thinking about our what you see here in this initial, like this is the Mass Ave center line here, and if you go one tenth of a mile out. Um, or you go 120 or two tenths of a mile out, you could think about um, having, having two different subdistricts. So you could think about this like outer district here as having, um, having a slightly lower density that still complies with that 15 dwelling units per acre, or maybe even a little bit less, maybe that's three family by right. And then within the corridor, um, right along Mass Ave and you know, within a one tenth of a mile back from Mass Ave, thinking about having a little bit of higher capacity for units. Um, so as the DHCD guidelines say, you can have sub-districts where you have a lower density and then a higher density within those areas. Um, if something like this were considered, a total district size could be anywhere between 200 and 450 acres. So if you start thinking about um, dispersing 5,100, a unit capacity, dwelling unit capacity of 5,115 units over that, you start getting to about 15 to 26 dwelling units per acre. Um, so that does get a little bit closer to the minimum, the minimum density required by the um, guidelines, but it, but it still is in compliance. So again, in closing, I think, you know, as Jenny mentioned, she and I have both been sitting in on a lot of um, sessions where people have been talking about these guidelines. We've been listening to what other communities have had to say about them. Um, we definitely would invite your questions and comments here and also would love to talk with you more about submitting feedback to DHCD in, in advance of that March 31 deadline. So thank you very much. Thank you, Kelly and Jenny both. I really appreciate uh, you breaking down where we are and some of the initial thoughts for compliance. Um, I know that this has been, that there's been a lot of information coming out that you've all had to synthesize. So I, I really appreciate the work that's gone into this. Um, I'll now open it up to members of the board for any questions or comments, and I'll start with you, Ken. Well, I'd like to thank you. Thank Jennifer and Kelly for uh, this representation. That was uh, pretty good. Um, I would like, to, I wouldn't mind taking a look at a closer look at that and propose that maybe we can set up a couple of um, forms, maybe with, uh, with the affected neighbors, uh, you know, in those certain areas uh, as, as one group of meetings, and then maybe. Um, Realtors and brokers and contractors uh, as another form and see what their feedback is. And then have, having that in mind, let's, let's take a look at it and see it, see all the different views that have this. Um, this is a pretty major change. Um, I think it's been, pretty much follows um, the master plan actually. And it kind of resorts back to what some of the old zoning was before we got uh, before this uh, 
uh, this newer version of zone came in and uh, de-densified some of this uh, uh, public area here. I mean, um, along the Mass Ave corridor there. So um, it's encouraging and it, it might also help us out of this um, um, uh, housing uh, shortage that we might, we might be experiencing right now. I think that's a good thing. So um, I think I just need more time to look at it. I can't really, you know, I think what you have there is really good. And I just need to look at more of the details and think about that a little more. That's my initial reactions. Great, thank you, Karen. And I should ask um, Kelly and Jenny, I know that um, I, I don't believe that we were able to post this presentation with the agenda today, but is that something that you can send out or post to the ARB site following the meeting? Yeah, we will we'll post it to this meeting agenda and just uh, give a follow-up email to the board to remind okay, great. you that it's posted when it is. Great, thanks. I think to Ken's um, point about just wanting a little bit more time to, to sit with it and, and understand the recommendations, that would be fantastic. Um, Jean, I'll go to you next for any questions or comments. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I'll start by echoing what Ken said. Thank you for the presentation and for sort of walking us through what various options might be worth considering in going forward. And I agree that having some sort of public process before we choose which option or which combination of options is I think in a really important step. A um, Couple other thoughts and then I wanna say something fairly destabilizing to the conversation. But um, my, my couple other thoughts first are um, the, the legislation, all right, so I've read the legislation and the guidelines a few times, but I can't say, thank goodness, that I've committed it to memory because that would be a little crazy. So I may get a few things wrong. But I believe that while it prohibits special permits, it does allow for site plan review. And I think that if we go ahead, I think we should have a serious discussion about whether we want to have site plan review as part of this, and if so, how that's going to work, who's going to do it, et cetera. So I think that's an important piece to add. And I think one of the reasons that's important is if we do something like this, I think we have to think about green space, open space, climate, things like that. And I think site plan review gives us an opportunity to figure out how to make, make that part of the project. Because, I mean, this isn't going to happen all at once, as Kelly said, you know, these are all built up areas. It's just going to give people who own the property there the opportunity potentially to, um, to do something with the property that they can't do now. I, I would be a little concerned about um, the size of structures we would allow on Mass Ave. Because as we have discussed many times on this board, uh, Mass Ave is where we should have taller buildings, more density. And I think for me at least, and I'm mean, I'm open to other discussion about this, I think three or four unit buildings are not what we're looking for on Mass Ave. Um, if we were to do this, and um, at least in some places allow more than four unit buildings as of right, we're gonna have to revise the inclusionary zoning bylaw, which now kicks in only if there's a special permit required. Um, um, what else did I wanna say about that? Oh, um, I, I've read the guidance a number of times trying to figure out if the bus depot in the Heights would qualify as a station. And I know it's sort of vague. I'd say it doesn't, um, but if DHC says it does, they wrote the guidance. So I think we'd have to live with that. But I don't think the bus station as a, the bus depot as it currently operates meets the current guidance definition 
of a bus station. Um, so now, um, I want to have one question before I get to my destabilizing or semi-destabilizing comment. Um, I hoped we'd already gotten there, but okay. No, 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 we haven't gotten there. That's what we're forward to. No, no, no. Um, <laughs> It's, I'm just, you know, what's that called where you set something up so people- You've stay really built it up, Gene. In the conversation, okay. So what would it take for us to become a housing choice community that we're not now? What would we have to do to be able to get into that other bucket? Can, can you discuss that now or do you want to come back to us? Another Kelly or Jenny? Time? Yeah, I was gonna say, Kelly, why don't you talk about how we've computed it right now, where we stand and what we would need to do differently. So the, to be a housing choice community that you have to have both a certain amount of housing production within a certain time period. And then if you don't have the upper threshold of production, then you also need to meet a certain number of criteria. A lot of that is what you allow in your legislation or in your regulations. So in Arlington, we haven't met that because the lowest threshold for production is 300 units within um, a five-year period. So we are, with the approval of 1165 RMSF and with the Downing Square Broadway Initiative and with a couple of other sort of like smaller projects, we're, get, we're getting close to that 300 number. We could pretend if, if a couple of other projects we're, that's that, so we don't know for sure, but if, if there were to be, you know, two or three other projects in the next two years, we, we could most likely meet that 300 number. So I didn't want to say we, we could not become a housing choice community because, because the possibility is out there. We also have met a, a number of the criteria, um, including with the passage of the ADU bylaw by town meeting last year, uh, we're getting pretty close to the threshold number of criteria that would have to be met in order to get that lower, that lower number. Um, one of the other criteria that could be met is um, allowing multifamily by right in one zoning district. So if we were to pass MBTA communities, like some zoning that is compliant with MBTA communities, we would then, that would almost be a twofer, right? We would have, um, we would meet that requirement for housing choice and then we would also be compliant with the MBTA communities legislation. So I think we're looking closely at what other things could be required. I think a parking reduction is another one of those. Um, I don't want to assume that's going to pass town meeting, but if it were to pass town meeting, that would that would edge us a little bit closer toward meeting those requirements. So that's why I said it's, it's potentially out there in the next two years, um, but we have not met that yet. Okay, thanks. That's really helpful. The other point I wanted to make before I um, said the other thing I was going to say is um, you talked about um, allowing two ADUs, but one of the proposals that we're going to consider next month would be to allow two family homes as of right in the single family districts. Well, if that were to happen, they could under the ADU bylaw have ADUs as of right. So if we did that, would we be effectively creating this MBTA district or getting pretty close to it? We have to do a little bit more interrogation. I don't, I don't know that we would meet that 15 dwelling unit gross density under a district, but we yeah, have to look. I, I think, well, my sort of off the top of my head, not very good at math, is that um, a three unit building, uh, 15 units per acre is about 8,000 odd square feet lots, at least in the R1 district, um, the minimum lot size is 6,000 square feet. So theoretically, it would work in the R1 one district, the R2 district, it's 9,000 square feet. So if there's a two family with two ADUs, that would also meet the requirements. So I think it's, I, I'm not positive, but I, I hadn't thought of it until you put the one slide in. So I think it's worth taking a look at and our knowing that when we consider the warrant article, which I think is up on March 7th, I think. 
Um, so here's my semi -destable, uh, destabilizing comment. Um, look, I think the legislation is really important. And there are a lot of communities, including Arlington, that need to provide for the possibility of more multifamily housing near MBTA stations. Um, but I think the guidance is pretty terrible. Um, and I think it goes far beyond what the uh, legislation contemplated in a lot of ways. And I think DHCD is hanging everything on that one little phrase in the legislation that says something like, it can determine you know, if the requirements are being met. But I'm not clear that it gives DHCD the right to do something like say, you know, um, MBTA communities with a station, 20, they have to add potentially enough zoning so there'd be a 25% increase in housing. And if, you, if I think about it, it even seems a little backwards to me in that the places that should have the higher percentage are the places that have managed to keep out more housing than Arlington's managed to keep out. You know, those I think are the places that should really have the higher percentages or the higher total requirements. Um, and I can think of a lot of more, you know, suburban places that have T service and, um, and, you know, whether it's rail or bus where, you know, they're, they're really a lot behind us. We can do more, but they should be doing more than we're doing. And this is backwards as I see it. So what I'm really hoping is that the town, and I don't know if the town would be willing to do this. I, I would like the town to submit comments that say, you know, we think the legislation's important, it's needed. The town's committing to do more but this is really bad guidance and here's what's wrong with it and make some suggestions for um, how it should be changed. Um, so I, you know, I'll, I'll write something. I haven't written anything yet, but I think there's a lot that can and um, needs to be written about it. Um, I won't get into all the legalisms that I've thought of. I'll save those for my letter. But that's it. Great, thanks, Jean. So that's specifically around the calculation for capacity. Well, it's, your... it's, it's partially the calculation for capacity, partially whether they even have the authority to determine that at all. So yep. you know, do they have the authority to determine that? Um, do they have the authority to tell us that we can go outside the half mile radius? Do, if you know, do if they have the authority to do the calculation, is this calculation at all reasonable? Um, and then there are a few other things that um, I don't have off the top of my head that I think are really um, problematic about it. Great. Did you want Jenny or Kelly to weigh in, or just wanted to share that and then plan on submitting some additional? Well, I think maybe it would be helpful if I had a conversation with Jenny and Kelly offline, because I guess they have a different point of view. I might have a different point of view about it. And they've been known in the past to convince me that I'm in error. So that could happen there. OK, uh, so we'll just we'll leave that comment uh, for for now. I appreciate, Jean, you uh, giving so much thought to this and, and sharing your your um, your initial thoughts here. Uh, so, Melissa, I'll go to you next for any questions or comments you might have. Um, well, well done, Kelly. I thought that was an excellent presentation in terms of making it concise and relatable um, for everyone. I think, um, you know, in terms of, you know, from my experience, my perspective, the MassWorks grants can't be lost in terms of how they're using it, whether it's a carrot or stick. Um, you know, in the communities I've worked for, you know, they've averaged, you know, 
actually closer to the $3 million range. I mean, that's, you know, obviously a smaller selection, but it can be significant. Um, so it is, you know, something to, you know, really kind of consider as you kind of look towards compliance going forward. I was surprised though, I didn't realize that we haven't really received anything in the last five years. Um, so, I mean, I think, you know, it does take, you know, the coordinated department effort, you know, DPW, you know, planning as well to kind of think those things through. Um, and I haven't looked, I mean, I've looked at, I've sat on some of these, um, I guess, seminars, webinars on the topic. One thing I don't know if we mentioned really was also that I think mixed use would be considered um, as part of this. It's not strictly housing alone. So as you know, the public's kind of digesting this in general to keep that piece in mind. Um, and then, you know, I kind of, I hear what you're saying, Jean, you know, in terms of the communities, you know, I've worked for too, as you kind of go further out, there is more, you know, the structure of the transit um, is different, um, but in terms of looking at the existing connections anyways and bus routes and getting us kind of flowing in that direction so that the development, I mean, in my mind's eye, I see this much more as a transit oriented development effort. Um, you know, it is housing, but it's also kind of with the proper balance of potential mixed use and the expansion of the zone is kind of one of the ideas that Kelly presented. It has a way to kind of blend both, you know, address the housing as well as, you know, space for, you know, kind of business commerce too, that can be a good blend. Um, I mean, I think also my two cents is there, it, you know, it's, we, they are looking for comments. So Jean, I mean, put, articulating those, I'd be interested to see what that looks like on paper um, as you kind of bullet it out um, because my, my sense is that they are really looking for feedback. They really do want that. Um, and I'm, you know, so I'm hesitant to be like, okay, we have to do it just by what they've said today. So, I mean, because I understand it's very iterative at this point. So, um, but well done. Thank you so much for kind of giving us kind of the current date update. Great, thank you, Melissa. Steve, any thoughts you wanna share? Oh, you're on mute, Steve. Uh. Hopefully now it's better. Oh, excellent. So first, I, I think this could be, I'm really excited about this as an opportunity. Um, I agree with Melissa that, you know, this does seem to be getting more at transit oriented development. Um, and I, I think that's, you know, honestly, if you compare that to what we did in the 20th century, where the general idea was to build things spaced far apart and, then have to drive every place and build lots of roads and interstates, et cetera. And now all we have, you know, some decades later is wicked bad traffic and a lot of greenhouse gas emissions due to passenger vehicles. So the, to me, the idea of transit oriented development is just thrilling. Um, now, I think a lot of it will depend on, you know, where we draw this on the map. Um, but a couple of things that I'd sort of like to hope we could keep in our minds as we do this is um, to the extent that the district is in East Arlington, an area that's subject to future sea level rise and flooding, um, that we could incorporate some flood resilience measures into that part of the district, even if they're just, you know, sort of preliminary to what, say, the zoning bylaw working group has been discussing, um, you know, just even a requirement to provide free board uh, you know, some distance above the base flood elevation and making sure that height wasn't, you know, a, an obstacle to, to doing that would be, you know, I, I think a good start. I would hope that we could also allow some housing, some level of housing by right at a scale that would, that would trigger our inclusionary zoning. So six plus units, um, or if we change the inclusionary threshold to something else, but you know, allow that by right, probably with site plan review. Um, you know, as I agree, there are a lot of 
other components, sustainability and otherwise that, um, you know, are, are, there's advantage to discussing it in a public forum. I also, knowing that the bikeway is also a transit resource, um, you know, thinking of, you know, perhaps thinking of doing a little bit of build up around or making part of the district sort of follow the bikeway um, in places. Um, and finally, I am intrigued about the idea of Arlington Center. Uh, it's not one, it's not an area that would have occurred to me, but, um, you know, maybe considering, you know, I, I think one thing to, one thing to, to consider would be bus ridership and areas that are commonly used that have, have high ridership now, um, might be, you know, good candidates, but, um, Again, I, I do see this as an opportunity. I realize it's just draft guidance, um, but hopefully we'll get some clarity future, clarity in the future. And um, I sent my comments in early, uh, but I will send a copy of those to staff so um, you have an idea of what I said. Uh, that's all for me. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Steve. Uh, are there any other comments for Jenny and Kelly before I open it up to um, for public comment. I already see we have one hand raised. Gene? Yeah, just one other thing, and, and Steve reminded me when he said Arlington Center, one of the things that we just started talking about that was in the housing production plan is what to do with the Russell Common parking lot and thinking about that as an area that would be part of this, I think would be a very good idea. Thank you, Jean. I agree as well. Making a note. Okay, great. Uh, anyone else before Steve? This is a very far out question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Any chance of getting the red line extension back? <laughs> yeah, Jenny, I'll I, let you feel that one. <laughs> I, I actually get asked this question quite frequently. You, so it's, it, is, it is not an unusual question. Mm -hmm. I mean, could we get it back? I mean, we, I think the focus is on the Green Line extension going to Mystic Valley Parkway right now. If we can get that to come back, that's what we are still committed to trying to do and working with other communities to make that happen, if it could. Um, there is actually an opening for the potential for an environmental impact review um, and so we are looking at that. Bringing back, extending the red line, as you know, would be uh, giving up, potentially giving up or significantly modifying what we have as a, an amazing resource in the Minuteman bikeway. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that that would, be, that would be a whole different conversation um, and one that I am not certain that we are in a position to entertain at this time, but is certainly maybe something to talk about in the next master planning process. Okay. There are definitely people who ask that question frequently. I don't Steve. think it's out of the question, but we would need significant investment to make something like that happen. And the focus has been on the Green Line extension for that reason. Steve, Thank get you in your time working. machine and go back to 1970. Also might require some money to do that, but anyway. All right, uh, so with that, I will go ahead and um, open this up to the public for any questions you might have um, for Jenny and Kelly. Um, I'll just note that you should, uh, if you are interested in either speaking about this or asking any questions, please use the raise hand function at the bottom of your screen. When I call on you, please make sure to um, introduce yourself with your first, last name and address and you will have up to three minutes for your comments. And I will start with Don Seltzer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Don Seltzer, Irving Street. Um, I just wanna point out that the, what the legislatures passed last year was fairly simple. They said they wanted 15 housing units per um, acre located with in half a mile walking distance of the transit station. In fact, you'll find numerous places within the guidelines that were issued that emphasize that 
any such district has to be easily accessible to pedestrians to the transit station. Um, I've provided the board with some detailed calculations. I've done a great deal of analysis of our existing district that's within half a mile of our life station. And in fact, we check off a number of the boxes of the requirements. It's actually around 17 housing units per acre and within half a mile, and it um, occupies 62 acres of developable land. And the other thing that should be pointed out is that even the, the, Depart the State Department of Housing and Community Development has far exceeded what the state legislatures have passed by adding this additional requirement, which really overrides everything else, saying that we have to provide a district in which multifamily housing is available by right um, that would accommodate as much as 5,115 housing units, which is many times higher density than the 15 per acre that the state legislature wanted. Um, I'll just stop there, except I provided a lot of data to the board. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have at this time and try to provide you additional detailed data if you have any questions on that. Thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker we will have this evening is Elizabeth Dre. No, no questions from anybody? No. Thank you. Uh, Elizabeth Dre. Uh, oh, great. I don't know why my video is not working. Um, I'm gonna, sorry, a few sure. clarifying questions. Um, sure, I'm sorry, Elizabeth, would you just mind um, also identifying your street address or your street? Uh, yes, Elizabeth Dre, Jason Street. Thank you. Thank you. Two clarifying questions, because this is relatively new to me. Did I understand that it, the 50 acres could be cumulative over different locations in town? Okay, Kelly's not perfect. Um, That's a yes, uh, I'll just, I, I did, Kelly's nodding yes for, for people who can't see her on the screen. Go ahead, Elizabeth, sorry. Um, I lost my second question. That's it. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the next person will be Kristen Anderson. Uh, Kristen Anderson, 12 Upland Road West. Um, I am not really prepared. <laughs> um to speak but i i just wanted to say that i was at an mwra meeting um on the 17th of february um and i heard that um the mwra's sewer system through the alewife uh currently uh cannot handle uh capacity for the area uh, during major storm events. And I just want to read what um, Don Walker, uh, the uh, he's a longtime consultant for MWRA said at this meeting uh, so that you can all consider this. And I would hope that when um, you provide uh, DHCD some feedback that you will mention uh, that MWRA has some work to do uh, in the alewife area. Um, this is very important. Um, so let me read this. The MWRA system is limited by downstream capacity. Under very large storm events, the capacity of the alewife Brook pump station, which is downstream of MWR 003, that's uh, one of the CSOs, one of the combined sewer overflows um, in the alewife, which by the way, um, discharged 20 million gallons of uh, sewage water in 2021. Um, the capacity of the alewife Brook pump station, which is downstream of MWR 003 is reaching capacity. 
It's a very large facility, has 90 million gallon per day capacity. That then discharges into sewer, sewers that are conveying flow further downstream and going to the Chelsea Creek headworks. That then reaches capacity. And there are events when the capacity of our Deer Island treatment plant, 1.2, 1.3 billion gallons per day is reached. So there are limits to what the MWRA can push through the system. Um, and that's the end of the, the quote. Um, basically what uh, Mr. Walker was stating is that the MWRA sewer system through the Alewife is not capable of handling the area's current needs during some rainstorms. Climate change is going to greatly exacerbate this problem. So the sewers, the combined sewers in um, the municipalities on the other side of, of the Alewife Brook from Arlington really need to uh, separate their stormwater from their sanitary sewers. Uh, and if they do this, then there will be more capacity at the Deer Island uh, water treatment facility. Thank you, Kristen. I, I appreciate it. I see that Gene has his hand up. At, um, I assume it's to res respond or to, to further discuss on this on this Did topic. I, was that my three minutes? You, that was, yep, yeah, that was your three minutes. So thank you very thank much. You. I appreciate thank, it. Yeah. I think it's, it's very important. And I'm not saying this because I want to stop development in the area. I'm saying this because I want those sewers to be separated and I want the pollution to stop. Thank you. Yes, we definitely understand the, um, and I appreciate the passion which you, you bring to this. So um, Gene, I'll, I'll um, kick it over to you. Yeah, I was um, also at that meeting uh, that Kristen was at and I think she um, correctly um, quoted uh, the person to talking about the limits of the MWA capacity. I'd like to just add like a gloss on that though. Um, one is, I don't think that what will end up getting proposed by this should have any significant impact on that because we're, we're not adding, we're not talking about a greenfield that's, you know, all of a sudden going to have a lot of housing on it. So this is going to, whatever we do is going to be a very, very slow increase in the number of units. But what I think we should think about, two things. One is most of the lack of capacity going into the Alewife pump station is all the excess stormwater that gets into the sanitary sewer system from not combined systems, but from separate systems like no. Arlington, Belmont, Lexington, places like that. And I know Arlington has some plans and is putting some of those plans in place and has done some work already to try to reduce that excess flow into the sanitary sewer system. One of the things I think we might want to think about doing, and this will take a lot of thought whether it makes sense. So this excess flow is sometimes called I and I for inflow and infiltration. Some communities require that new developments remove like twice as much INI as would get added to the system or that currently exists. So I think if there is going to be any large um, additional uh, development in town, not an individual place here or there, it might be worth having a conversation with um, DPW about what they're doing and whether it makes sense for them to ramp up some of these requirements or whether we need to add them to um, site plan review. Great, thank you, Jean. And I'll pass it over to Steve, who I um, know has been uh, speaking with a few town officials about this topic as well. Uh, yes, I've... Um... I, I was uh, sending, exchanging email with uh, Mike Rademacher, our director of public works, um, you know, asking precisely some of these questions about sewer capacity and, and that sort of thing. Um, one of the things Mr. Rademacher pointed out is that 
you know, back in the 70s, Arlington's population peaked at 53, 54,000. And at a time when, you know, low flow appliances, toilets, et cetera, were not, you know, really commonly in use. So even just based on the capacity that we had back in the 1970s, there's actually a fair bit of headroom in our system. Um, you know, that doesn't speak to what's downhill or, you know, downstream necessarily, but, you know, what, what, our, what our system can accommodate. Um, he also said that one of the biggest challenges is I and I, um, and we do have a program to regularly do sewer, do line replacement, um, you know, and it's just, you know, trying to, you know, basically prevent water pipes from leaking and from and prevent water from getting into the sanitary sewers. Um, but it is, you know, it is something that they, you know, consciously work on. Um, and, you know, we do work every year. Um, and I, just to close, I, I would like to express some, I, I know the Yale Wife Brook CSO issue is something Ms. Anderson has been uh, pursuing with a lot of energy lately. And I just wanted to express some appreciation to that. It, they really should, you know, finish separating. I, I think my personal opinion is that Cambridge and Somerville should finish separating their systems. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, are there any other members of the public who have any questions on the MBTA community's presentation? Um, if not, I will go ahead and close public comment on this agenda item. All right. Um, and I'll turn it back over to any final questions or thoughts from the, from the board. I know that Jenny and Kelly have both expressed that they'd love to see any, any comments in writing um, that we can then pass on to um, the DHCD. All right, so seeing none, we'll go ahead and close this agenda item. And again, thank you so much to Kelly and, and Jenny for the presentation and for leading our discussion this evening. Uh, so the next item on our agenda is uh, an update from the Envision Arlington Standing Committee and the Open Space Committee. Um, and I believe that we will start with, uh, Jenny, do we have everyone here um, which one would you like us to, to start with? Everybody's here and there are three of them are all on screen now. So uh, maybe Fabulous. maybe start with Alex and then Jared, and then Wendy can talk about open space. Fabulous. Alex, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself and um, give our uh, update here for Envision Arlington? Sure, thank you. Um, so thank Alex you. Bagnell. Uh, Wyman Street. Uh, and I'm going to go over a few things and, and then I think Jagat has a, a variety of other things. Um, so let's see, over the past two years on Envision, uh, let's see, and, and I'm keeping some of this to kind of a housing focus, uh, helped organize with Karen Kelleher an educational forum uh, where several mission dri driven affordable housing uh, developers came and we organized a Zoom so that they talked about how they develop projects. Uh, where their challenges lie, and uh, touched a bit on what we as a town might do to be more attractive to them. Uh, I'm working on developing a future educational forum, where I think actually I'll do something with Steve to continue to demystify uh, zoning for a more general audience. Um, Envision also helped organize the last townwide candidate night and organized and ran the town meeting member candidate night. Uh, in 2020 and plan to do the same this year. Um, with uh, Len and Greg Christiana, we've developed a kind of a nascent civic engagement group that could be handy um, kind of as it develops for a variety of outreach purposes. Um, and then I have one kind of long-term suggestion or idea to throw out, uh, which is so Envision was originally developed as Vision 2020, right, which is a, a, a long looking plan for Arlington and, and wondering if that is something that might interest people in us doing that again with perhaps a very long term focus, I don't know, 2050 to align with some goals for net zero that might 
try and tie together and seek community involvement, tying housing, transportation, environmental goals, education, and diversity, among other things, into something that we could then develop more actionable plans on. And finally, if there's anything the board would like us to be pursuing, we're all ears. That's Thank great. You. Thanks so much, Alex. I'll actually um, turn it over to, to Jagat for any um, updates you might have, and then take some questions from the board before we move to the open space committee, if that works for you, Alex. Thumbs up. All right. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Jagger, if you could introduce yourself and any uh, provide any updates you might have, we thank both you and Alex for uh, coming this evening. It's my pleasure. Jagger Tadea, Winter Street. Um, I, I joined um, Envision Arlington in June of last year as uh, the ARB's nominee, and it's it's been a real pleasure to serve on the standing committee um, with uh, with Alex, uh, Scott, Craig, and, and, and all of the other standing committee members and uh, task group chairs. Um, certainly been very, it's been a very educational experience so far. Um, and, and to see the variety of topics that Envision Arlington um, has, uh, has been involved in uh, so far. So um, just to add to, um, <clears throat> to the updates that Alex provided, I mean, just I'll, I'll go through a, a few topics, uh, essentially um, on, on the various task groups that are within Envision Arlington. Um, I believe almost all of the existing task group chairs have been reappointed. So notably Rebecca, Rebecca Gruber um, as the task group chair for diversity, uh, Gordon Jamison and uh, David uh, Garbarino for fiscal resources task group, um, Brucey e. Moulton and Tom uh, Ebrecht um, for Sustainable Arlington, uh, Michael Brownstein for Education Task Group, and, and several others. Um, the, uh, the Community Engagement Group is the newest task group, as, as Alex mentioned, and the idea is to really foster inclusive forms of civic engagement uh, and to um, somehow amplify our outreach um, and connect uh, Arlingtonians um, from as many diverse demographics and viewpoints as we can, we can manage. And I think the measures of that, <clears throat> of that uh, activity would be potential improvements in uh, participation in town elections, for example, or surveys or, or civic events, uh, you know, such as the candidates night, which, which also Alex referred to and which, which we will um, co-sponsor with uh, the League of Women Voters in Arlington this year. So those would be some measures for you know, how, how well we're doing on community engagement. Uh, one of the groups that I've been uh, trying to at least uh, follow and, and attend most of the uh, meetings for has been the diversity task group. And it's been really impressive, um, the, the collection and variety of topics that Rebecca Gruber has, uh, has put on the agenda and, and really raised awareness about. It's a very active and passionate group uh, of people, though informal uh, as it may be. And, I think you know there may be some topics, um, especially coming out of that task group, that I think we want to uh, discuss further within the standing committee. Um, some of the some of the um, topics that I, I encountered were you know, around um, the diversity um, in uh, the Arlington Public Schools and Superintendent Holman, Ms. Thomas are, are spearheading uh, certainly diversity topics related, related to the, uh, the police uh, force. Um, and you know, within affordable housing um, as well. Um, until uh, recently, I was the newest member of the standing committee, but uh, recently Carolyn Murray was appointed uh, to the open seat um, nominated by the town manager. Uh, so I believe we now have full complement of standing committee members. Um, one of the main tasks for the Envision Arlington standing committee is the, is the town survey. Uh, the 2022 survey is I believe, close to finalization and uh, additional communication uh, will be, uh, be posted very soon. Um, the 2021 survey report has been delayed due to, uh, primarily due to the pandemic and I believe it's in final review currently uh, with the town manager. So that should be available soon as well. Um, in addition 
And so upcoming, um, there's the um, candidate night for the townwide offices, and that will be held on March 23rd. Uh, the signs for that will be posted outside town hall in March, and um, which maybe the posting should also appear on the town calendar very, very soon. Um, there's also, um, and I guess the other upcoming event I'd like to highlight is, uh, is this idea of a Broadway uh, design uh, contest, which um, Envision Arlington will also co-sponsor. And uh, we'll hear a little bit more about that. So those were generally my notes and happy to offer any other uh, details or perspectives uh, if anyone has. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate um, hearing about uh, everything that the different task groups are, are working on. And um, I will uh, run through the board for any questions or comments. I believe that Alex um, posed a, a question about um, you know, whether taking on a long range you know, new, new vision towards, towards 2050 or some other um, some other uh, longer longer range planning is something that that we would find uh, helpful from Envision Arlington. So that might be a, a great topic to weigh in on as well. So I'll start with uh, Ken for any questions or comments. Uh, <coughs> uh, thank you, Rachel. Excuse me. <clears throat> uh, Alex and uh, Jagger, thank you for your. Uh, helping us out here in this, uh, this committee here. Uh, one of the things uh, uh, I did not hear anything about, and I just wanted you guys to talk about this, is, um, um, in, is the growth of this, uh, of this town. Um, you know, in growth of, I'm, I'm not talking more like business. Uh, there's, a, there's plenty of people advocating for housing, as should be, but, uh, what kind of uh, businesses we have in this town? How do we grow that? Uh, are we reaching out for that? Or is this gonna be slowly becoming a bedroom community? Is that where we're heading? Is that what we wanna do? Or do, do we wanna have a downtown center? Or do we wanna have um, little nodes where we can have little centers like, uh, where you can do your, uh, go, off, uh, go out and have a group of restaurants in certain areas um, or, do we want to have streets where there's activity in, uh, in vendors and stuff that, uh, that you can walk down the street? Um, or is it gonna be all these quiet communities with hedges and, and, and manicured lawns and everybody's, you know, this, I mean, what, those are some of the things that I, I, I wanna talk about and see um, what other groups are interested in and what they wanna do. And I think you guys are a good spearhead to see it, uh, what the town, what the rest of our neighbors want, to, want in this town. Um, have there been some talk about that in your, in your committee? Uh, no. Uh, we have not spent a lot of time on economic development. Um, I would say that would be a really interesting topic for kind of the long range planning about, you know, long group discussions about what do we want the town to look like in 30 years and, um, then begin to fill in the how we might get there. I think that's great. Uh, that's something that would interest me a great deal and help us too, as you know, as we do our stuff uh, and get more people involved uh, in uh, and hear their in hear their input to this town instead of just a you know, a few people who are very loud and uh, want to control the town the way they want it, you know. Uh, it's more inclusive. That's that's what I'm trying to get at. Excuse me. Sorry about that. No problem. Yeah, Thank I, you. I might just order, offer one perspective. I mean, the, uh, the there was a uh, discussion in the context of the town survey and, 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 and associated um, sort of topics and themes. Um, and, and uh, you know, about uh, the, the three commercial districts that we have. Mm -hmm. And you know how we might uh, further um, you know, raise awareness and uh, also uh, participation of the community in, in supporting those districts. What might the districts do to make themselves more appealing? But I think you know that's 
it's 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 a much uh, bigger discussion than and much beyond the scope I think of envision Arlington as such. But uh, certainly the uh, the CEG um, I think might be a good vehicle uh, to partner with where you know the ARB might sponsor um, community outreach you know with a certain targeted um, uh, tar targeted set of questions. Uh, to bring back data, mm -hmm. you know, which might help inform policy. So certainly that, I think that might be a good partnership with the ARB and Vision Army. Great, thanks, Thank um, Jenny. I, I think if I'm not mistaken as well, just to um, piggyback on and also to address Ken's comment, if I'm not mistaken, I think that ATED, the um, Tourism and Economic Development Committee is being kind of retooled tooled right now and that there will be a seat for either a member of the ARB or a designee of the ARB on, on that board, which um, to, Ken, to your point, I, I know will address some of those topics as well. Jenny, is that is my understanding correct on that? That is exactly right. Um, the newer composition and charge for the Arlington Tourism and Economic Development Committee is just that. It's meant to be a little more comprehensive, um, a little more inclusive, um, also bringing in some of the pandemic um, sort of recovery task force work that we've been doing um, and trying to kind of merge efforts into something a little bit greater. Um, we have just as a point of reference in the past, we've talked about a business task group um, because that um, was something at one point that uh, the Envision Arlington uh, like previously had been considering. But what we're talking about in terms of like a future long range plan or just in general long range planning, this board is going to be talking about updating the master plan. And I would anticipate that we would look out, you know, another 20 years from now um, to some bigger, you know, far reaching goals. And it would incorporate some of the, you know, certainly a lot of the planning work that we've been doing and build off of that. But I think it would be an opportunity to really find a better way to engage in Vision Arlington in that future planning effort. Um, I know a lot of effort had been done to create the Master Plan Advisory Committee back in 2012 and 2013, um, including some of the people here who probably participated or were formally a part of that committee. Um, and so we have time to kind of imagine that and think about, you know, what the what that might look like. And it's something that I'm hoping we can start talking about actually in the next fiscal year. So it's good to to hear that um, Envision Arlington is, or at least you're talking about that. Um, and there would be some opportunities to align. Great, thank you, Jenny. Um, so Alex, it looks like there will be plenty of opportunity <laughs> for some uh, cross-pollinization and um, in engagement as, as we um, undertake the next master plan. And I, and I think Envision Arlington is the, the perfect group to, to really take an active role in that as well. Excellent. I will add, I did run this by our co-chairs before just trotting it out there. Oh, great. So, and they are supportive. <laughs> Fabulous. Thank you. Um, I'll go to Jean next for any questions or comments. Yeah, thanks for Alex and Jagged for coming and, and discussing this. Um, so when I moved to town like 31 and a half years ago, they were, the town was in the process of doing the initial Vision 2020. And it took a lot of time. They had, you know, excellent consultant facilitator come in and um, spend a lot of time um, to make it work. And um, I ended up on the standing committee for many years and chairing the environment task group for many years also. And so I think it's a really important place for a lot of um, people who live in Arlington to get connected to the types of things that are happening in Arlington and to um, sort of move some of those things along. You know, I, I agree with Jenny. I think there, there, there should be some way to blend um, what Jenny had talked about in a new master plan with what um, um, Envision Arlington is thinking about. What, what occurred to me when, when Alex and Jenny and Jagat were discussing, it would be interesting. And, and I guess I should say, you know, 
planning 30 years in the future is like, you know, a crystal ball that's pretty cloudy. So we make some good guesses, but who knows what it's really going to be. But to me, it would always be interesting to take a look at like, what do we think the entire metropolitan area would look like in, you know, 30 or 40 years, whatever the time frame is. And with that as the big frame, what's Arlington's role in, in the metropolitan area? Um, because I think that's changed over the decade. And there are some opportunities for us to think about what that could be in the future. So I'd just like to put that out as another piece worth thinking about um, as you go through this. And the other, and I don't know if Envision Arlington has done this, do you have the right task groups? Should there be different task groups? You know, are there missing task groups that might be helpful to have? So those are my sort of thoughts about this. Great, thank you, Jean. I think um, your comment about placing Arlington in the context of the metropolitan area is a, is a really interesting one. Uh, Melissa, any questions? Thoughts for Alex um, and Jagged? No, thanks Alex and Jagged for the update. I don't have any questions at this point. Great, thanks Melissa. Steve? Yeah, I, I'd like to start with my own little Envision Arlington uh, anecdote. Um, well, this starts back in the days when it was still called Vision 2020 because 2020 was still a, a few years off. But um, like I could remember my first spring in town or living in town, uh, getting a survey in the mail. And at the time, I think the quest, we were starting to get to the point of needing to do a budget override. And there were a bunch of questions about, you know, how should municipal funding be prioritized? And I was just blown away by the fact that the town sent me this survey asking about how to, you know, uh, set priorities. Um, yeah, I, it, it really, the group is, uh, I, I think, a, a unique and important resource. Um, I do very much like the idea of, you know, sort of, I guess you can call it getting back to its roots. Envision Arlington was formed in like 1992 to look forward, to have a forward looking view that went out to 2020. So 2022 to 2050 is kind of the same horizon. Um, it's going to be a very important three decades for us, um, not for you know, us as a town and us as a, uh, as a, as a, you know, as a metropolitan region. But um, I do think, think that's, you know, and, you know, an excellent idea to consider. Uh, thank you. Great, thank you, Steve. Um, and with that, I'll thank you, Alex and Jagat, for uh, being with us this evening and uh, move on to Wendy, who is here representing the Open Space Committee. So Wendy, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us this evening. You could oh, um, just introduce yourself and sure. um, uh, maybe give us an, an update on um, what you've been all been working on at the Open Space Committee. Okay, well, thank you for this opportunity to talk to uh, the ARB. I've been the liaison for the ARB with the Open Space Committee since I joined the Open Space Committee, which I think was about five years ago. Um, and I've been involved since the master plan started uh, um, uh, back in 2012. Um, so in the open space right now, where I just want to say it's a volunteer group that right now has 11 members and there's a liaison with um, all the different departments that are related to open space, like public works, recreation, and the planning department. Um, and the committee is tasked with, the prepare, with preparing and monitoring a seven-year open space and recreation plan. And we are now in the process of updating that plan with CPA funded uh, consulting firm, Horsley Witten Group. Um, and the process has included a number of public outreach opportunities, um, a survey and a couple of um, virtual forums uh, due to the pandemic. We haven't done anything in person as nobody has for the last two years. So um, so we're in the process of, update, of updating the plan and um, I just, I, I pulled out the goals for the open space and recreation plan that was uh, uh, these, there were basically uh, working with the same goals, although we've reorganized them into a different order um, because things have changed over the last seven years. 
And I'm just going to read those to you. Um, and you should familiarize yourself when the new plan comes out, there's going to be a lot in there. And I have a couple of uh, quotes I want to read that are sort of hot off the presses. They may be reworded between now and when it actually is published, but I thought it was relevant. So the goals are addressed climate change, sustainability, and environmental justice. Um, two is increase public awareness access and stewardship of natural open spaces and recreational spaces. Three, coordinate and strengthen local and regional planning and management of open spaces. That I see as part of the um, ARB being part of the process that the open space plan is, is talking about. Four is preserve, maintain, and enhance existing open spaces, including parks, recreation spaces, and historic sites. And then five is acquire valuable undeveloped lands to ensure their protection. And I think that was sort of more focused on the Mugar property, but because there's very little land to be acquired. Although Elizabeth Island is an example of something that in the last few years was acquired um, through uh, CPA funding, I believe, um, and the Arlington Land Trust. Um, so there are projects that we've taken on be, since the last um, uh, open space plan. Um, and we, we track a lot of projects that have been going on uh, throughout the town. I know recently there was the um, Wellington Park was one of the um, projects that was through the um, um, Mystic uh, River Watershed Association. And um, that was funded, I think, through state funding, uh, having to do with um, mitigation to, sorry, my clock's going to ring in the background here, um, for uh, resilience uh, in the, um, you know, looking towards uh, impacts of climate change on the town. Um, Another project we did was we uh, created a set of walking maps to uh, encourage people to get out and explore their neighborhoods and the town as a whole. Um, letting people know where the, the existing open spaces are, a lot of little parks that people are unaware of. Um, and that was something that when we did town, popular. people took the maps and hopefully we got more people out, uh, out uh, uh, seeing what we do have in terms of, of open space. Um, I wanted to read from the, um, the plan that's under uh, currently a draft uh, or in draft form. Um, this is under the analysis of needs um, around infill development and redevelopment. Um, we have limited undeveloped land and infill development and redevelopment are the primary ways Arlington meets growing demands for more affordable housing and economic development. Even with this pressure, the town must balance development with nat natural resource um, protection needs, resilience goals and quality of life in Arlington. And I think that that is, is looking at, you know, balancing um, development with, uh, natural resources and making Arlington or maintaining Arlington as a livable community. And some of the examples are walking and biking connections between development projects and nearby conservation areas, recreation facilities and public spaces. Um, uh, natural based solutions to manage stormwater um, that also uh, contributes to landscaping in the town. And we've done that um, the town's had a number of um, rain gardens and um, the retention areas that are for storm uh, runoff uh, that are natural based where they're planted. Um, I, I know there've been a couple of pilots, pilots for that. Um, and then meaningful public spaces with the development that have benches, tables and other seating, landscaping and shade trees. Um, so that would be things to be considering as new development is proposed. Um, then um, looking ahead, the town should uh, review recent infill and development projects and measure, um, measure the natural resource benefits achieved through their design. Uh, a review might identify gaps or missed opportunities to add amenities. Um, and I, I think an example of one of the uh, amenities that came to my mind was uh, when the Brigham uh, apartments were built, there is a natural uh, retention area that's sort of next to a park 
um, on the edge of the high school. Um, so although it's on private land, it's something that is, um, it enhances the development in a way that people, you know, passing through um, and also just in terms of water retention, it's a, it's a retained, retaining area. Um, but I think the idea to review some of the projects that have come through and see whether things have worked and um, what hasn't worked and have that, you know, that feedback towards uh, new projects that come up. Um, for higher density, um, may not be able to accommodate open public space on site. The town might want to consider other ways to increase this amenity for residents around town. Um, and they could pri it could prioritize investments in walking and biking connections um, or similar to the tree law, tree bylaw, explore options for requiring payments um, be made into a recreation or open space fund that the town could invest in existing public spaces near the project site. Because as I, I think one of the things that um, as we look into our, you know, the next seven years of the, the open space plan is as the town becomes denser with new development is sort of balancing, how do we balance that with um, either increased open space, which is, you know, it's really hard to increase when there isn't the space there, but to um, at least have it in mind when, when development is proposed, like how close is it to open space? Um, I think especially projects that, you know, when there's no yard area and if they're family projects, how, how close are they to a place that uh, families can get out and use a public space? Um, and um, one of the things that this that, that is mentioned in the open space plan is um, the idea that um, how important the natural features are to development. That if we, and I think that the balancing of development with um, open space resources is really critical to the livability of um, being in Arlington. I mean, we're not a city. Um, our open spaces are, a lot of them are really small, but very, if, if they're in a neighborhood, they are very used, uh, used very heavily by people in the neighborhood, especially if they don't have a yard. Um, and um, in addition to that, there's the, the whole adapting and mitigating impacts of, of climate change, which is a, is a huge uh, factor going forward um, that I think we're all aware of. Um, one of the one of the um, terms that is is new to me is the idea of environmental justice, and that that's that's a part of the um, as development occurs that uh, what open space we have is available to all members of the community, and the, we talk about people as they age, people who have mobility issues. And what was the third one for, for um, just economic, that there tends to be less tree cover in the areas that are considered, um, um, what is the term? It's not just environmental justice, but it's the, the areas that are um, lo lower income, I guess you would say, mm -hmm. areas. What's it, Jenny, what's the term for the areas in town that are, uh, um, we're, we're wanting to make, it equitable for people to access the public spaces. So uh, concern for how close people are and, and to encourage um, in development, encourage uh, access to those public spaces. So um, I guess I wanted to end with, um, spoke about environmental justice. Um, Oh, I know. Well, there was one other thing I wanted to say that um, one aspect of open space um, is not just the natural spaces, but it's also the hardscape in town. And um, looking at, at Mass Ave as a space that is used by everyone and um, 
I think that the, the little parklets that came up during the pandemic were an example of how a hardscape actually does become usable open space. And um, thinking about Mass Ave in a, a urban planning kind of way, um, this may be getting a little outside of the open space uh, committee's um, uh, actual what they're tasked to do, but I feel that is the, it's the um, it's kind of the interface between the uh, ARB and open space to consider how the spaces are being used and to think about it in an urban planning, urban design way. So that I would encourage the ARB to, to think along those lines and you probably already do. And um, I feel like I would like to be more aware of what you all are doing. And I tend to attend the um, zoning pieces when you're talking about zoning, but a lot of other stuff goes by without that I'm not aware of that you work on. So, and then I just wanted to finish is Arlington increases in density, the open space committee will continue to preserve and enhance existing open spaces, both owned by the town and privately held. The committee is also committed to maintaining the green character of the town by promoting the balance of development pressures with open space needs for the residents of the town. So thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Wendy. It's um, wonderful hearing about all of the different things that you're working on. I appreciate all the time that you and, and others take on the open space committee. Um, and I think the point that you made at the end regarding hardscape and, and parklets and some of the things that, that become part of open space that we don't traditionally think of in that in that realm is is really important and we certainly um, over the past two years have, have seen how important that's become to residents in the town um, through parklets as you mentioned and, and other items so that's a great reminder for us um, so I will um, again run run through our um, board and see what questions or comments you might have for Wendy starting with Ken I have none right now. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ken. Jean? Yeah, thank you, Wendy. And Wendy and I kept on planning to talk and never got around to do it. And I think it was mostly my fault, so I apologize for that, Wendy. Um, yeah, thanks for the um, presentation. A few thoughts. One is on environmental justice, which was one of my professions for a number of years. I'm on the board of a environmental justice organization now in Chelsea. I think a couple of things is that the state has an EJ map where if you go down to Arlington, you can look and, and it's done on the census block level. Mm. And much to my surprise, there are quite a few census blocks in Arlington that are designated as environmental justice. And I think, but you'll look at the map and see if I'm wrong. I think they're not for income. I think they're for uh, minority status. But um, so you might want to take a look at the at the map, which you can easily find online. If you can't, I can send you the link. Um, two things that I think might be interesting to to line up with those EJ neighborhoods and the open space plan is tree cover and heat island effect because one of the things that's often found nationally is that EJ communities tend to have much worse heat island effect, much less tree cover. So I think it's worth taking a look at is, is does that line up or not line up um, in Arlington? And in addition to access to parks, which I think is a very important piece, the other thing is what do the parks provide and do they provide what people in those neighborhoods need? Um, and I haven't sort of thought through Arlington and see whether there's you know, a good correlation between the populations and what the parks really provide, you know, how well they're maintained, um, things like that. Um, the other piece I'll just mention so I, I was on a Zoom lecture about a few weeks ago from a professor at uh, the University of Virginia, and he introduced a concept I had never heard of before, and I have to read it so I remember it, 
called Biophilic Cities, which I thought was really fascinating. And I think part of what I, at some point, I think our board should talk about as a board is whether we want to and should start incorporating some of those um, standards, I guess, into what we think about, especially if we're doing another master planning process. And it seems to me it would be interesting for the Open Space Committee to also take a look at that and see if there are things that might be too late for this open space plan, I understand, but might be helpful to incorporate into the open space plan. Because I found it um, um, very interesting, very mind boggling, and um, very compelling way to think about cities and uh, what they can do um, to, you know, for environment in a lot of different ways. So yeah, but thank you very much, Wendy. Appreciate your being here and working on the open space plan. Can I just respond that we do have a, um, we do have a, a environmental justice map in the open space. I just forgot how it was determined. Yeah. Great, thank you, Wendy. Uh, we'll go next to Melissa for any questions or comments you might have for Wendy. Um, no exact questions, but thank you, Wendy, for your work. I think um, just along the lines of what, you know, Jean was saying, you know, the connection between, you know, the cities and nature, that biophilic kind of city kind of attitude, I think it brings so much value and quality of life to, you know, any place. I think I was just visiting um, Watertown and their design guidelines and access to the open spaces that they do have um, was pretty impressive. And I mean, I know these are kind of, you know, pieces that come in different forms, but we're all working towards that, I mean, to some degree. So I appreciate your work. And I just, you know, want to thank you for that at this point. Thank you, Melissa. Steve. Uh, thank you. Um, like Ms. Zemberry, I also appreciated the uh, comments about hardscape. Two, two places that I really enjoy hanging out are like Broadway Plaza and the plaza in Davis Square. And it's kind of for the same reason. They're uh, places where you can sit, relax, hang out, people watch. They're just, you know, spaces that make me feel good. Um, so I, I'm glad to see, glad to see, you know, those getting some attention. Um, one city that I've really been admiring um, lately has been Paris, where uh, they are, you know, taking, starting to take areas that were basically a maze of roads, uh, the area around the Arc de Triomphe, for example, and then just starting to, well, you know, maybe that can become sort of an urban forest. And some of the renderings for this are, are they look they look great. Um, I, you know, I'd hope that, you know, we, we would not compartmentalize like this piece is open space and this is a business district, but, you know, I, I'd hope that we could intentionally blur some of the lines because it is nice when, um, you know, there is greenery around. Thank you. Great, thank you, Steve. Any other comments for Wendy? All right, well, thank you so much, Wendy. I really appreciate it. And um, we do look forward to finding opportunities to work together with you and the rest of the Open Space Committee when we have uh, developments that we're reviewing and um, finding that intersectionality between the work that you're doing and the work here at the ARB. So thank you so much. Thank you. And I would just like to say when the, when the plan is out, there is a section that really does that part I was reading from that addresses, you know, development and that I hope you are able to take a look at that. That sounds great. Jenny, I believe that that will, um, can, can you just speak to the, the board in terms of how that will be um, shared with the, with the board? Yeah, actually, um, so I've been, I had been providing some updates on the open space recreation plan. Um, I think I've given maybe two or three updates in the past, uh, particularly when we were doing the work over the summer. Um, and I mentioned that it will come to the board for your review and approval, just like the last open space recreation plan did. 
um, and the board ends up writing, you know, a letter just supporting it. It's not actually a requirement for you to adopt the plan or anything like that, but it is something that the board has done in the past. Um, so we're planning to do that again. I, I'm working with uh, David Morgan on my team is the person who's the, the project manager and I'm expecting that uh, relatively soon there will be another forum um, and the draft will be forthcoming and it will probably hit this board sometime in April for a review and uh, before it's actually finalized. That, that was my understanding um, the last time we spoke with the consultant who's um, Horsley Witten Group um, about the timeline. The Open Space Committee, of course, has been having more regular meetings and discussions about it. And so they might have some more recent content that um, I haven't seen in a more full or, you know, full draft form. But as soon as I have something that is ready for the board's review, I'll provide that to you. But my expectation is it will not be until April. Great. Thank you, Jenny. I appreciate it. Welcome. All right. Thank you so much, Wendy. Uh, so you. that uh, concludes item number two, committee updates. And we'll now move to agenda item number three which uh, are two sets of meeting minutes. And we'll start with the meeting minutes from January 24th, 2022. And I know Jean, you have already sent a few comments through. Um, I, so I'll I incorporated all of, I, I incorporated feedback, sorry, Rachel, um, from no Steve and Jean. Okay, and I great. put it in track changes. Um, some of it is very small. So if you want me to, I can review line by line or I'll just kind of roll through and you can. Why don't you roll through and I'll see at this time as we're rolling through if anyone else has any, um, any comments. And I'll start with Ken. No, I have no comments. Okay, Melissa. No comments. Okay, uh, so we'll just scroll through their comments. I didn't have anything on this set of meeting um, notes other than what I saw Jean already sent through. This is to bring these two things yeah. together. Yeah. Okay. It's not clear there. That was a long evening, apparently. It was a Sorry. very long still, evening. No, I'm still nine scrolling. pages. That's I'll be right. done shortly, I'm sure. No worries. There you go. Okay, great. Thanks so much. So is there, um, first of all, any other comments? Nope. Is there a motion to approve the January 24th, 22 um, meeting, um, meeting minutes as amended? So move. A second? Second. We'll take a roll call vote, starting with Ken. Yes. Dean. Yes. Melissa. Yes. Steve. Yes. And a yes as well. The meeting minutes for January 24th have been approved. We'll now move to the meeting minutes from February 7th. And I had two items here. Um, actually, Jenny, if you could go back up to the top, this actually says January. 7th at the top, it should be February 7th. And then my other comment was on the last page. Um, and it was, uh, where it says Mr. Benson approved the one, 322, I believe it should be moved to approve. And that's all that I had. So I'll go through and see if anyone has any other comments. Jean, it looks like you sent yours through for this one as well. Okay, mm -hmm. Steve, Steve. Um, nothing further. Okay, Ken. Good. Melissa. Good. All right. 
Is there a motion to approve the February 7th, 2022 meeting minutes as amended? Uh, yes, uh, as amended, I have motion for that. Great, right, thanks. All right, we'll take a vote. Ken? Yes. Dean? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Steve? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. So the February 7th, 22 meeting minutes have been approved as amended. That closes agenda item number three, and we'll now move to agenda item number four, uh, open forum. So at this time, uh, any member of the public who's joined us this evening who wishes to speak with the board, please use the raise hand function at the bottom of your screen. Give a minute, see if anyone wishes to speak this evening. Uh, James Fleming. I'll just remind um, everyone, please introduce yourself by first, last name, and address, and you'll have up to three minutes. Go Hi. ahead, James. Thank you. Welcome. Hello, James Blowing, 58 Oxford Street. I had a question. Um, this is, I know it's not the hearing for one of my articles, but I got a legal notice in the mail about the, um, the business districts being expanded, which I was surprised by because we're not one of the abutters to any of the properties being. Um, Rezoned. The, this it, it come. It came from the. I guess from Rachel, from you, or you're signing at the bottom. So I was. I was just wondering why. Why would I have received this letter if we're not in the butter nor one of the owners of the properties? Jenny. <laughs> um. Yeah. I. I would have to check back at my office to figure out okay. why you were on that list. I don't know, Kelly. Can you add anything to that one? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice. Um, yeah. We did send we did send that notice to all the abutters, and then I believe we also sent it to we sent it to the some of the neighboring communities as per law, and then we send it also to the um, petitioner. Oh, okay. So yeah. you received it's just, it because it's just you were the so petitioner. For your own confirmation that an additional. <laughs> ah, okay. Yeah, okay. it's a requirement that we send out that legal notice in addition to the legal notices that you send out. So it's it's basically just a dual confirmation. Okay, so so like my immediate neighbors may not have gotten one if we're not close to. No, okay. no, you should have just received it as the petitioner. Okay, because I, I was about to change the motion to just because to, I was like, wait a second. I, I don't know who's being up there. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Sorry James. For any confusion that we might have caused. I think we just wanted you to make sure you had a copy. Yep, that's good. Thank you. All right. Thank you, James. Uh, anyone else wishing to speak this evening? All right. So with that, we'll close um, open forum. And I will see if there is a motion to adjourn. Rachel, I'm yeah, sorry. I I, just sorry. real quick, I can't make a motion to adjourn, but I would love to. But um, no, it's uh, <laughs> that on, uh, I'm, if it's okay, on Monday night, which is the first hearing evening, I'm going to put on the agenda, Rachel I, and I have talked about this, um, the meetings in April. Okay. We're just going to talk about those and we're going to also talk about sort of the move to meeting back in person and what that will look like and when to anticipate that. Uh, but we'll put that on the agenda formally so we can talk about it on Monday night. Great, thanks. And then Jenny, just to confirm, um, while we're just talking schedule, I believe that we had scheduled all of our meetings through April. So I'm assuming that we could also okay. then talk about future meetings. Schedule in general will be on Monday night. Exactly. Right. Okay, super. Fantastic. Um, any other comments before I take a motion to adjourn? All right, is there a motion? Motion to adjourn. Back can Great, we'll take a roll call vote, starting with Ken. Yes. Jean. Yes. Melissa. Yes. Steve. Yes. And I am a yes as well. We are adjourned. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening and We'll see you next week for our first hearing. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.